Therefore, it's time for members' statements. The member from Dufferin Caledon. Thank you, Speaker. As we celebrate Black History Month, I want to recognize one of our special constituents, Kevin Jr. Mr. Jr. is a decorated military veteran who joined the Canadian Armed Forces in 1980 as an infantry soldier in the Toronto Scottish Regiment. He later became the first black regimental sergeant major for the TSR. In 2003, he was appointed as a diversity advisor for the Canadian Forces leadership team. In this role, he identifies systemic barriers to underrepresented groups and provides advice on policies, directives and actions to eliminate these barriers. He was deployed to the Republic of Sierra Leone in 2007, where he served as a senior advisor to the local armed forces. While deployed, he developed the first course for regimental sergeant majors in Sierra Leone to increase their professionalism and leadership capacity. His many accomplishments include receiving the Order of Military Merit, being a recipient of the Queen Elizabeth Golden Jubilee Medal, receiving the Sierra Leone Service Medal, and the Merit Award for the Black Association of Nova Scotia. And of course, our annual Remembrance Day ceremonies would not be the same without Kevin's marshalling passion. When asked what his favourite quote was, Mr. Jr. answered, If I can help someone as I pass along, then my living shall not be in vain. His unshakable spirit of courage, kindness and compassion serves as a reminder of the values that we as Ontarians hold so dear. Thank you. Thank you. Further member statements. The member from Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, typically, I'd like to use my statements to highlight some of the good things that are happening in Ontario and around my riding. Unfortunately, today is not one of those days. I have to use my voice and my statement today to raise awareness about an issue that's happening in the Chatham-Kent area around well water contamination and the quality of well waters, uh, well, wells in that area. On February 13th, I was invited to visit families in Chatham-Kent to see for myself the contamination of their well water that they attribute to pile driving during construction of a nearby industrial wind turbine. Speaker, they're driving piles through the bedrock and into the aquifer, and they suspect that that's what's happening. Uh, it's loosening up uh, contaminants and, and debris and uh, allowing black shale to enter into the aquifer that is then suspended by the vibration of the turbines and entering in their well water. This is what they suspect, but they need the government's assistance in determining exactly whether that is the cause and what those health ramifications are. Imagine quality water is a question in this province in 2018, and it shouldn't be. So I implore the, the government, I implore specifically the Ministry of Health, the data has been given to the Ministry of the Environment. Now it's incumbent upon the Ministry of Health to initiate a health hazard study to determine whether that black shale is uh, is detrimental to their effect, to, the, to their, their quality of their water, and to their health. We implore them to do that. I want to thank Kevin Jakubik and David Lusk and Mark Sapier for uh, informing me of this, and I want to ensure them that we're going to continue until we find a solution to this problem. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Trinity Spadina. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Last April, my private member's bill, Bill 109, the Reliable Elevator Act, received unanimous support in this House on its second reading. Shortly after that, an independent study led by Justice J. Douglas Cunningham was commissioned by TSSA to examine elevator availability and provide recommendations to possible solutions. Last month, this ministry, ministry of Consumer, uh, Government and Consumer Services announced Ontario's action plan on elevator availability, adopting all of the 19 recommendations from the study. Last week, Minister Mc, uh, Tracy McCharles introduced Bill 199, Access to Consumer Credit Reports and Elevator Availability Act. This new legislation, if passed, will make Ontario the first jur jurisdiction in the world to establish standards for elevator availability. Mr. Speaker, in a vertical riding like Tunis Spadina, safe and reliable elevator service is critical to the quality of my constituents' daily lives. At a recent visit to a com Toronto Community Housing Building, I received very positive feedbacks on this action plan. This plan will publish information about, publish information about the, their building's elevator performance, help elevator owners negotiate better maintenance contracts, create a standard for new high-rise buildings ensuring there's enough elevator, elevators to serve the residents, and enhance access to elevators for first responders during emergencies. I'm proud that this government's work in finding a solution for the residents of our Thank vertical you. community. I urge all members of this House to support the speedy passage of the enabled 
legislation of a one bill, uh, bill 199. I thank you. I tend not to want to say thank you more than once. Member Statements. The member from Chatham Kent Essex. Thank you, Speaker. I rise today to salute the Chatham Kent Municipal Heritage Committee. In 2017, we marked the 150th anniversary of the Dominion of Canada and the establishment of the province of Ontario. Now, to mark the occasion, the committee has created a calendar featuring local heritage properties. I happen to have one hanging in my Chatham office, courtesy of Joe Nagel, a member of the committee. The featured buildings are both designated and past recipients of the Mayor's Heritage Preservation Award. Of course, our country and province are much older than 150 years. My own riding of Chatham, Ken Essex, is one of the oldest European settled communities in Ontario, going back to the late 1780s. So Chatham Kent has a wide variety of architectural styles covering the past 200 years, and we have more than 80 designated properties and several hundred listed properties. The earliest surviving structure in my riding is the Thomas McRae House. It was built in 1812, and it was the site of a skirmish between American troops and the Canadian militia in December 1813. Chatham Kent has one of the greatest collections of Queen Anne architecture in Ontario, as well as one of the largest collections of mid-century modern architecture, especially noted by Joseph Story, an architect. The Municipal Heritage Committee has administered the Mayor's Heritage Preservation Award for the past 15 years and has promoted awareness of our architectural heritage and best practice preservation of heritage properties. So I hope you'll join me in recognizing the achievements of the Chatham-Kent Municipal Heritage Committee. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek. Thank you, Speaker. Today, Speaker, I'm talking about the WSIB system. It is shockingly inadequate, continually leaves deserving individuals in difficult situations with limited support. In 2009, Speaker, the WSIB lost $3 billion in value on the markets. At that time, I expressed my concern to this government and to the WSIB that changes needed to be made to cover the loss, or there could be dire consequences. And yet, despite continual warnings and advocacy from many, this government has done little. I recently met with Carl and Peter from the Injured Workers Support Group in Hamilton, as well as rep representatives from IABGO just today. From these conversations, it is clear that the WSIB coverage has been dwindling. The WSIB has re reduced the amount it spends on prescription drugs by one-third annually. That's more than $30 million on drug coverage a year alone. Gone, Mr. Speaker, gone. Not to mention severe cuts to direct health care services. To make matters worse, the WSIB pulls some pretty underhanded tricks to get away with a lack of financial resources. Among the most serious of these is deeming. This is when the WSIB suggests an employee who has sustained a permanent injury is capable of finding work, and even though they usually can't and aren't, they get cut them off. Often this determination is based on a cost efficiency, not on a cover worker's recovery. As a result, many are left in poverty. This is heartbreaking, Mr. Speaker. Today, I'm calling on the government to do two things. Number one, read over the Ivaco bad medicine report as well. Number two, do not allow the practice of deeming to continue. This government might not have listened back in 2009, but I, hopefully they are listening now. Thank you. Further members, statements. The member from Kingston and the Islands. It gives me great pleasure, Mr. Speaker, to rise today and recognize Kingston and the Islands Dr. Dorothy Cotton and her induction into the Order of Ontario. Last night, I had the pleasure of attending the induction ceremony, recognizing Dr. Cotton and many other accomplished Ontarians for their work in the arts, science, music, culture, business, and beyond. It was a very proud moment for the recipients and all of those in attendance. Dr. Cotton has been practicing psychology and advocating for mental health issues for 30 years making her a leader in the field. She is Canada's only diplomat in police psychology, providing a variety of services to police organizations, including pre-employment and fitness for duty assessments, program development and research consultation. She also received the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal in 2012 for her, her exemplary work. In addition to her direct clinical work with clients, she also taught at Queen's University and St. Lawrence College and has lectured at centres throughout Canada and the UK. Dr. Cotton's lifelong dedication to the discipline of psychology can be clearly seen through her unique ability to inform and educate on issues pertaining to mental health in an entertaining and accessible manner, such as her Kinchin Singh Psychology newspaper column, which not only offers a unique perspective, but is a great way to get us all talking about some challenging issues in an accessible way. On behalf of the province, and in particular my riding of Kingston and the Islands, I extend 
a most sincere congratulations to Dr. Cotton on receiving this honour and all the fellow recipients yesterday evening. Thank, Thank you. you. Further member statements. The member from Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to shine a spotlight on a new and exciting economic development opportunity in the town of Bracebridge. Last month, it was announced that Nipissing University had sold its Muskoka campus to Dewey Educational Group, a private school specializing in ESL training for international students. It is unfortunate that Nipissing University had to close its Bracebridge location. I am, however, delighted that a new educational institution has taken advantage of this opportunity to be part of the Muskoka community. I'm also happy to share that Nipissing has used some of the funds from the sale of the campus to create an endowment fund to help support future students from Muskoka. Meanwhile, international students will be finding a new home away from home in Bracebridge at the campus, which includes an instructional building and residences. Dewey Educational Group is based in Mississauga, where, where they've been helping students from abroad prepare to attend English language colleges and universities for 13 years. Dewey Educational Group's new campus should be operational by the end of the year. International students will be provided with an immersive environment to learn English as well as to explore the beauty and culture of Muskoka. I wish to join the community and local municipal leaders in welcoming Dewey Educational Group and its students to Muskoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. For the member statements, the member from Ottawa South. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Last weekend, I was pleased to join my colleagues, the Ministers of Natural Resources and Community Safety and Correctional Services, as well as the Attorney General, at the ninth annual Global Community Alliance Gala. The gala celebrates Black History Month and the diversity in our city. The gala was founded by Moses Pratt, or Yomi, as he's known to many. He's supported by many organizations and people, none more than his wife, Kelly, and he always makes a point when he's getting thanked to say she deserves most of the credit. So this year's gala had about 350 people in attendance, and it was a pretty packed evening, not only by the number of people that were there, but by the number of things that went on that evening. So this year, there were performances by St. Patrick High School Dance and Step Team, musical performance by Angelique Francis, Lily Ahmed won the RBC Black History Month essay contest. Canada Post unveiled this year's commemorative stamps, Lincoln Alexander and Kay Livingston. Dr. Reverend Anthony, uh, Reverend Dr. Anthony Bailey spoke about the essence of community building, and Sergeant Mo Elmi from my riding received the Professional Achievement Award. There were many more awards for youth and business achievement, as well as community building. Speaker, there's an African proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Yomi and Kelly, thank you for bringing us together so we can continue to go far. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Scarborough Rouge River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to say a few words about the Black History Month. John Grace Pusinko, the first Lieutenant Governor of Upper Canada in 1793, precipitated the abolition of slavery in Canada. Ever since then, the African-Canadian community has been seeking equity within the wider Ontario population. Yes, the laws of Ontario do not discriminate based on the color of a person's skin, but the people in my writing constantly remind me that the discrimination is still alive in some segment of our population. I believe that the education is the key to eradicate this disease. The month of February is a great opportunity to educate people of Ontario of the great contributions of the Caribbean African community. Scarborough Rouge River is fortunate that uh, we fully participate in the education of anti-racism, promotion of Caribbean African Canadian culture. Every summer on Simco Day, Scarborough Rouge River comes alive with a massive party. The Junior Canadian Parade attracts tens of thousands of people from all over North America. Please join me, the streets of Scarborough, to the heartbeat of Ahsoka and Calypso. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to see that the Black History Month has grown since this legislature recognized February as Black History Month in 1997. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you.
I thank all members for their statements. It's therefore now time for reports by committees.